Mike is going to kick us off right now. And uh, he's going to show you, you know, one of the things I do, I work with a lot of clinicians, especially looking at research and literature, some of the things going on in the industry. Um, and I think he's got a great perspective of what's going on, especially with zirconia, from a clinical standpoint. He's way smarter than me. I can't even spell my own name. But I'm going to let him take it away. Thanks, Dr. Mike. All right. Thanks, Chuck. All right. You guys are glad to be here today to talk about some zirconia. You know, I may be slightly smarter than Jack, but he definitely can drink me under the table. That is for sure. That's the Marine in him. Um, you know, so we're going to talk a little bit about zirconia. Jack's going to do a pretty deep dive into on X prosthetics. I'll look at one case that we collaborated on together and some other full arch cases that I've done uh, with argon zirconia. And so this is me. Uh, you know, cheesy photo, a little bit younger than what I am now. But Very handsome. Yeah. You're a handsome man. A lot less wrinkles. <laughs> um, and so this is our facility in Charleston. So the Mod Institute, we're a digital dentistry focused education center and we also have a comprehensive uh, dental practice where I pretty much only see full arch cases, either fixed restoratives or implant. And so one of the things that I always like to start my presentations off because I, I like to try to stay super fluid in how I'm thinking. And so this is a guy, John Maynard Keynes. He was a stock trader in the early 1900s and an economist. And, you know, he has this famous quote, when the facts change, I change my mind, which is what I like to do as well. And so I have to admit that I had a zirconia dogma that was pretty outdated and untrue. Um, and Jack has really changed my perspective on that and then switching over to using, you know, argon zirconia, I'm finding indications that I never thought I would have used zirconia for. Veneers, um, ultra aesthetic cases, you know, and the bonding literature is actually really great on zirconia now, which is something that I always had a concern on as well. You know, so these are kind of some of the things that I thought but we're going to look at why that's not really true. And so this is one of the cases that we did together. And so I printed these dyes out on uh, surgical guide resin because it's clear. And I wanted to get a good shot of actually how translucent uh, the incisal edges are on this multi-layered zirconia. And just super, super impressed. And so this is a bonding study. And so, you know, there's really two ways to look at bonding zirconia. One is micromechanically, which is kind of how we've done it for a long time, which is just aerobrating it with alumina or tribochemically coating it with silica. And so they took some uh, zirconia, polyzirconia, and then they aerobrated it with different size particles at different pressures. And they wanted to see if this affected the bond strength. And so this is super important. You know, we know 3Y is pretty much indestructible, but when we look at getting these more aesthetic 4Y, 5Y, we know that if you aerobrate them too much, that you can induce some tetragonal to monoclinic uh, transformation, which can weaken the zirconia and potentially lead to failures. And so, what they found in this study was you could get pretty strong bond strengths um, with just the air abrasion. There was no difference between the particle size or the pressure, so that means we can do that a lot you know, less damaging to the zirconia. But when they aged it, they found that the bond degraded by about 50% uh, pretty quickly. And so we, that's not something that we can trust clinically if it's going to degrade you know, within 10,000 thermocycles by more than 50%. And so you know, the next thing to look at is really what else can we do outside of air abrasion that we can use to increase the bond strength and make it more uh, durable. And so in this study, they air abraded first. Then they treat it with MDP, which is a monomer that the hydroxyl groups will bond to the zirconia themselves. And they also, they took scanning electron micrographs of the zirconia surface, and they see that it's actually chemically bonded to with ionic and hydrogen bonding, which is super strong um, and, and really kind of the gold standard when we look at bonding. And so with that, they were getting about 22 megapascals of bond strength. and. Still some degradation with aging, but about 50% less than what we had before. And so the other thing, you know, zirconia is a transition metal. So if you look at the periodic table, it's right underneath titanium. And so this study, they wanted to look at what was a traditional metal primer to try uh, to bond to metal, which has some sulfur groups on it, and see if you could use that to improve the bond strength and or make it more durable. And so this is the MDP monomer. And so they treated with that. 
and they treated with this. This is VBATDT. Don't ask me to tell you what that word is. Um, <laughs> but these sulfur, sulfur groups on the end will chemically bond to the zirconia as well. And what's really miraculous is they did a super long aging process on this zirconia, 30,000 thermocycles, and they found basically no degradation in the bond at all. And so this is really getting us to the point where we're bonding zirconia at 20 to 25 megapascal strength and we're able to maintain that over long term. That's pretty much as strong as what we would be bonding lithium disilicate intraorally as well. And so the other thing that's super important with bonding zirconia is cleaning it. And this is something that I know my clinical colleagues can get super, super lazy about. Um, and so what can happen is these phosphate groups within the saliva will actually chemically bond to the zirconia. So if you don't chemically disturb them and remove them, you won't be able to bond to your zirconia at all. And so what they did in this study is they looked at five different ways to potentially clean zirconia after it's uh, contaminated with saliva. And what they found was etching, water, isopropyl alcohol basically did nothing. You get almost no durable bond to zirconia if you use that to clean it with saliva. But with uh, the two products up top, which one has zirconia oxide product uh, particles in it, the other uh, has MDP particles in it, is you're basically able to clean that zirconia perfectly and then you can get a durable bond to that even after it's been saliva contaminated. And so the other thing, you know, with the bonding with zirconia is, you know, we want to look at doing things super conservatively. And, you know, we know we can prep really conservatively with zirconia. And sometimes I like to push the envelope clinically. And so as far as how conservative my preps are. And so when you look at the literature and you start to think, well, what if bonding zirconia like lithium disilicate, we can provide some more strength actually to the material at ultra, ultra thin uh, thicknesses. And so, you know, this is a, a graph that basically kind of shows about the average number of newtons that we're able to apply to teeth um, with their max biting force. Um, but what we know is in Bruxers, you can get double and even more, um, especially in the posterior. And so you have to be really cognizant of that when you're looking at the thicknesses of the zirconia that you're using posteriorly. And so in this study, what they did was they took two thicknesses of crown. One was 200 microns, one was 500 microns. They put them on a fake tooth, and then they uh, tried to break them. They bonded them, and they adhesively, uh, they adhesively bonded them, and they cemented them. And so what they found was even at 200 microns thick, bonded zirconia could withstand about average of 700 newtons of force, 725 newtons of force before it failed. And at 500 microns, 1,430 newtons, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. And so this is our bonding protocol that we use in our office. So we air abrade, we clean uh, after we've tried in, MDP, VBATDT, and then we use an MDP containing cement. Because we know there's also a dose dependent um, bond strength to zirconia by putting more and more MDP. Now they've never, no one's ever really tested the upper limits of that, but when you get up to like 1% by weight or even higher, you can pretty much get double what you would have at 0.5%. So our philosophy is the more MDP we can get in there, the better the bond strength that we're looking to get. And so let's look at a couple cases that uh, Jack and I did together. So this patient came in, this case was done by a really well-known uh, cosmetic dentist in our area. These are lithium disilicate. Uh, they were done, according to the patient, about three or four years earlier. And his complaint was, when I smile really big, I'm not sure what's going on here. And I looked at it and I said, shit, I'm not sure what's going on there either. Um, you know, so obviously we want to help this guy out. And I want you to pay attention. We'll look at this at the end, but this lithium disilicate compared to what we were able to achieve with the zirconia, the aesthetics were as good or, or definitely better when you look cervically, but incisally. And so we cut everything off. Um, you know, the posterior restorations were fine, so we ended up leaving that to help maintain our vertical. 
get our digital scan. We temp this case. Uh, these are printed temps, shell temps that we designed and had ready day of. And so that little palatal strap is our seating guide to help us hold the vertical for when we seat those uh, and reline them or interorally. There's our temps in the mouth. And that's what he went home with that day, testing out. We added a little bit of length on his anterior teeth, so we wanted to trial that out, you know, both phonetically and with his lip function. And so this, this was a case we did with the uh, STML puck. And so that's everything milled out. Um, you know, Jack came down and helped us out with this, with this case. And I like to leave, we always do uh, extras anteriorly when we're doing cases because I just get nervous <laughs> about one of them <laughs> getting dropped. <laughs> and so that's our uh, restorations on the dies. And so we went from this to this. So I think pretty remarkable, and five years ago, I wouldn't say that I ever would have thought that level of aesthetics would be achievable with monolithic zirconia. And that has, uh, of course, the Murano magic, as I like to call it, on it. Um, but pretty, pretty remarkable. And I love the surface texturing he was able to get on this case. Just like super, super. I'm, I get nerd out about this kind of stuff, so I apologize. <laughs> And so this is another case. So this is a, a really a young lady in her early 30s, crossfitter, uh, really super in shape, but a lot of parafunction and a lot of wear going on. And she came in, you know, her main complaint was, I feel like my teeth are getting really short. And so we know we're opening vertical in this case. So our first step is we use a video gauge to, and a, a facially generated treatment planning philosophy where we're looking at facial thirds analysis to determine aesthetically how much we want to open this vertical up. And so that's us, you know, getting our facial thirds analysis, um, setting the vertical with, uh, this is our version of a Lucia jig. It's catted out. You can download it and print it on our website. Um, what I like about it clinically is you can bond composite to it. So if I want to index it anyway, it's very easy as opposed to the plastic ones that you buy. Um, and it's cheap. It costs like five cents to print it. So, um, you know, if you use those, go to our website, download them, tear it up. We do the scans at the vertical that we're going to restore at because what I found, and I do, I, I love doing digital design, so I do quite a bit of that myself, is the digital articulation for a, a opening or closing the pin is not really as accurate as it needs to be. And so I want everything set to where I'm going to have the least amount of potential for inaccuracies down the road. And so this was a case where uh, me and Dr. Renee got kind of crazy and ended up doing a full wax up and sending her home with bonded overlays, no prep bonded overlays, so she could trial out this vertical. So we did this all in the same appointment as about three hours worth. Um, but, you know, just look at the aesthetic changes we were able to make in a couple hours for this patient. And so she, of course, came back two weeks later and, yes, and was like, yes, I want to do it. Let's do it as soon as possible. And so this was a, this case we prepped pretty conservatively with some really conservative overlay type preps posteriorly. And uh, on, the, on the lower, we ended up doing basically what is a veneer prep. And, you know, Jack is the one who really kind of got me on to doing zirconia veneers and uh, you know I think you'll see with this case just what we were able to achieve and so this is the uh, temps the way she left the day of prep so this is also an STML case that we did that's everything milled out and this is what she left with and so you know, I think just understanding digital design, you know, knowing kind of the checkpoints that you're looking for, you can do these types of cases super predictably in a way that, you know, is not scary at all. And so this is another case. This is one of my favorite cases that we've done together. Um, so this lady, she came to see us. She had had, uh, this was an inherited case, which I always love to do those. Um, and so she had had implants placed and uh, Onyx hybrids uh, restored at another dental office uh, near to us. And her complaint was, you know, I paid all this money. I don't know why he couldn't give me wider teeth. So this is about a C3 or a C4 shade, which I couldn't understand why you would ever 
do a hybrid that shade unless someone specifically asked for it. But that's what she got. You know, there's some other kind of aesthetic problems here. She's got a reverse smile line. The anterior teeth are a little bit shorter than what they need to be. And there was a really improper implant placement. They basically are coming from the palate. So she had a giant uh, ridge lap on the prosthetic that was in place. So we took some fixture level scans and got some new custom multi-units made to move those uh, screw, cha screw access channels a little bit farther forward because we knew aesthetically we needed the teeth farther forward and I didn't want to make an even larger ridge lap which she was already having trouble cleaning. And so then sent her home. This was the wax up that I did the, the day that we delivered the multi-units. Uh, you know, obviously looking back at the case, canines are a little bit long, but sent all these uh, files up to Jack and his team up at Absolute and we got some prototypes. Um, and so tried these in, you know, confirming that we have our implant locations correct on the scans and there's no inaccuracies there. We're trialing our aesthetics, we're trialing our phonetics. She absolutely loved these and probably would have been happy just wearing those, <laughs> I think. Um, but get, get, we got the uh, prototypes in. This is a new toy that we've been using quite a lot in my practice. And so this uh, is a module which allows us to get digital data for mandibular kinematics that you can take into your digital design software. It has a direct integration with ExoCAD and you can export um, imprints that you can use in 3Shape as well. And so, you know, it allows us to capture chewing strokes. You know, we can capture, she's got a little deviation upon opening and closing, which you doing that on a traditional articulator, you'd never really be able to replicate that uh, when you're designing those lingual contours of the, an, the maxillary anterior teeth. So send all that to Jack. This was an HT plus uh, case. And then that's what we are gonna finish with. And when she came back, uh, her name's Vicky. I handed her the prosthetics. I was like, I want you to see what, what a master of ceramics can do. And she was holding them. She was literally shaking. And she's like, these actually look like real teeth. Why couldn't I have this before? And so that's what we have on the lower. Couple of minutes about photography, because I know you, a lot of you guys are, are probably spending, you know, a lot of time doing really great prosthetics. And in the age of Instagram, it didn't happen unless you took a photo of it. So I want you guys to you know, start documenting your cases, start putting them out there so people can know the great work that you're doing. We have a pretty simple photography setup for the way we took the photos of these prosthetics. You know, we have two lights that are not attached to the camera with bouncers at about a 45, de 45 degree uh, to the prosthetic with a macro lens. We like Sony in our office, but Nikon, uh, Canon, any of the cameras will work and you need a, a, a macro lens. This is a 90, but anything from like 90 to 105 can capture these photos and you want to make sure to turn your f-stop way up so you get a good depth of focus on your photos. Dr. Dupi, is that, is that a new mirrorless setup? Is that the Sony mirrorless? It is mirrorless, yep. The photography nerd on the front up here, like it. <laughs> and so that's where we finished. And so, you know, just going back to where she came in before, just huge, huge improvements. And so Jack teaches with us down at the Institute. He does a couple courses. One, this is the course focused mostly on uh, zirconia characterization, uh, green state, and staining and glazing. And they, we also do a blended course, which is more about digital design. Um, and we do a little bit of zirconia characterization. So if you, you know, want to learn more, uh, come check us out in Charleston. Love to have you guys down. Want to say thanks to Argon for having me. And you know, thanks, for, thanks to Jack as well. Um, and now he's got 300 slides to get to, so it's gonna, it's about to be burning. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Mike. I told you guys he was smart, didn't I? How awesome was that? Zirconia veneers is coming up all of the time, right? All of the time. So there you got a little glimpse of the data and what's going behind it, why you're seeing more and more zirconia veneers being prescribed. Because you can use them and you can bond them in, right? And we do, of course we have too much information and too many slides, and that would be, again, I think Mr. Jeff Luthrop right here in the front row for this, this creation of his, which is the lecture from doom. But <laughs> let's get started. <laughs> so I said this earlier, 
in the presentation from Mio, and if you guys were in there, you heard me say it, and it made sense, right? It, made, it did make sense. Yeah, it was nice, huh? Isn't it great? Um, but I'm gonna say it again because it's so true. There's, there's not a phrase that really looks at where we are in this point in time in our lives that describes what we're experiencing every day better than this. Everything's changed, nothing's changed. It's absolutely positively true. When we look at everything and we're looking at systems and protocols and zirconia and technology and we're like, oh, look at all the change. There's not, re you're not doing anything different, right? You're not really doing, you think you are, but you're not. And you'll see that play out time and time again when we go through it. When we talked about Mio today, we're talking about layering ceramics and pour some powder is dead. You're still layering exactly the same way. You're just using this instead of that. Everything's changed, but nothing's changed, right? Kind of makes sense. Like this case, so we're gonna do, just so we cover A to Z, you guys always still ask, uh, zirconia in the aesthetic zone, single unit centrals, monolithic zirconia, yes, of course, all of the time. This is seven through 10, there, or se this is seven and 10. Screw retained, okay, screw retained, single units, Full contour monolithic zirconia, right? Can you beat that? Is there any reason to do anything else? No, no. All right, so that, that takes care of the small cases. <laughs> we'll go to the hybrids, because <laughs> we have a lot. Um, hybrids are going through a cool transformation right now. <sighs> you know, I don't really know where we're gonna end up landing but we'll go ahead and take a look at a lot of it um, that's coming through. And a lot of you guys might be experiencing this right now in your laboratories. I'm kind of trapped and it's freaking me out. <laughs> so we'll go through a quick case study. And you know, there's, and I'm gonna talk about this a lot, but sometimes when you see issues with zirconia, the material gets blamed, but it's not the material. It's going to be the workflow, the clinical steps, the processes, and the laboratory processes that led to a failure somewhere, okay? It is your fault, straight up, or the clinicians, but it's not the material's fault. I've been doing this, I've probably put more of these in the mouth than, than anybody in my very blessed life that I've had, and I can tell you, if you see failure, go back and look in the mirror and see what happened, right? Because it's probably there. Prototyping, super, super important, you got to do it. More and more, you're just like, well, do we really have to prototype? Yes, you really have to prototype. That is one of the most valuable tools we have in restorative dentistry. We have to use it. It gathers all our information. It's a verification in the digital design. And once that's perfect, now we can go to making teeth. That is a bad day. Showed this one for a while. I talked about bad dental days earlier. Nobody understands what a bad dental day is unless you're a dental person. And if you are, then you know when something like that comes out, you're like, damn, that sucks. <laughs> That's just gonna be like way more time that you gotta spend working on. Now, do they all come out like that? No, especially when you got open-ended milling. Bo's sitting right there, Bo milled it. That's Bo's fault. Look at the size of the sprue on that central. Bo! But it happens. It happens, and Jeff wanted me to talk about green stage finishing, and I'm like, really? Do you guys really want to hear it again? Because I've been teaching it for so long, but, but really everybody still wants to, and it's funny, somebody said to me recently, they're like, nobody teaches green stage finishing but you, and I'm like, oh, you kind of got a point. Green stage finishing, we got to take that, that Bo did, Bo's fault, and we got to fix it up. Look at her in the back, she's like, oh my gosh. And we're going to turn it into that. All right, so if you go... There's the Arjun video when we did the green stage finishing live, right? And then I also have another green stage finishing video on YouTube. And I'll take you step through step of how I do exactly that, okay? On a smaller case, obviously not a hybrid. But if you go to YouTube, I think it's under the Absolute Talks and the, the Argon, you'll see me and I'll show you exactly what I cut it with, the burrs, the diamonds, the discs, the rubber wheels. I'll go through the whole thing, all right? Go through the whole thing. We're gonna center it. And then we're going to Mio it. All right, it's kind of like my life's work. We were always fighting against something. We were missing a piece of the puzzle. It's all kind of come together now. So I'm very happy, yay. 
And here is our patient. Um, he's kind of rough, right? Obviously, there was hybrid surgery that went on. I didn't put all that in there. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and basically do all the extractions, slick them, chop the bone, drop the implants, let them heal, come back, restore them. So you just seen the restorative phase. And now he's all fixed up. Now, I talked about this earlier. It's a little bit lighter of a shade than I would have liked. I mean, he let me do some like rotations and that's cool, but it's a little bit lighter than I would have liked. All right. He would have been really cool in like A1. He's not Florida man teeth, but he's close. He's on the borderline. All right. Who's doing Florida teeth right now? Anybody? That's sintered zirconia, straight up. OM1, don't stain them. Who's getting those in the lab right now? No? Huh? No? You guys are lucky because I get them all the time and I tell them, they're like, well, get some great pictures. I'm like, no, don't worry about it. And don't tell anybody I made those. <laughs> all right, so, and of course, HT plus multi-layer. But look at the results we're able to get. It's remarkable. It's monolithic. Huh? It's incredible. I actually got a little bit of heat um, for going back and saying the porcelain powder was dead. I had one guy. I don't have social media, I have LinkedIn, and then we have corporate accounts that do like my social media for me, because social media is scary. Um, and <laughs> the name of the presentation, and I've said it a lot before, is Porcelain Powder is Dead. And he came out and he was like, I am very skilled in the fine arts of layering ceramic powders, and I would disagree with you in that statement. And I'm like, oh, well, please come to the lecture tomorrow. Well, with all my skill and training, I just want to say Chicago's very cold and I won't be attending. <laughs> you can't beat that, right? It's monolithic. It's awesome. And everybody could do this. I've told you guys for years. How many years have we been doing this? I tell you, I don't do anything special. I'm not special. You can all do this. All right? You can all do it. I don't have any, like, magic. Jack magic. Dr. Mike thinks it's Jack magic, but it's not. It's really not. Wow. So, I want to pay homage to the cat man. Um, unfortunately, I don't believe the cat man made it. Um, as you can imagine, he had some issues other than that. That's a real case. And we went through and told him there was going to be all types of issues with function and this and that. And he would hiss at the girls in the office. <sighs> They're like, just give him fangs. Just please give him fangs. We've told him it's not going to work. He doesn't care. Just give him fangs. So we gave the cat man fangs. So this is a little just paying tribute to the cat man who um, I, I, I think he rests in peace now. There's our design. Green stage finishing. Even cat fangs. So you guys weren't expecting that today, huh? How about that? Three for a loop. You're going to expect something totally awesome. And then you got that. Centered, and this was one of um, our art team members, actually some art team in the back, uh, that Abby did this case. She was like, I'm like, do you want to do the Catman case? She's like, no way. I'm like, you could do it. There it is, centered. And there's her Mio with the denture. Awesome. It is awesome. Now, we rushed it through the laboratory, OK? We rushed it through the laboratory. Obviously, he had, there he had, life issues. Uh, I think we turned that in like four days to get it back to try to deliver it. And we didn't, I don't think we made it. Uh, so um, yeah, rest in peace, cat man. Moment of silence. But it's awesome. It's so awesome. <laughs> Just remember that. I'd be like, oh, man. All on X workflows. All on X. It's in every laboratory in every practice in the country. It's like commonplace. It's standard of care. You want to know what? It's a good thing, right? It's also a bad thing because bad things happen sometimes. And that's where, you know, when we look at all on X is a clinical process. Maybe it gets a bad rap. If we look at zirconia, maybe, oh, no, I've seen failure. Because it's so widespread, okay, that we really have to work hard on the education front because everybody has these in their office whether you're a small general practitioner or you're a one-man lab all the way up to the biggest lab in the country or the biggest group practices these are everywhere they become standard of care which is awesome because it's great i want them when i need to get something why not it's, it's perfect no well i'm still good i actually don't even have a crown can you guys believe that other than crazy cigar stains no crowns these are all mine 
But the case comes into the lab, and what do you do? What do you do? I'm from Buffalo. I escaped many years ago. But if you're in Buffalo and you ask Buffalo people who has the best chicken wings, 10 Buffalo people, you're going to get 10 different answers, OK? All on X, restorative workflows and processes are very much like that. If you go to 10 labs, you're going to get 10 different ways to restore that case. And sometimes, sometimes it goes way in the weeds. And these cases, when they go bad, they go bad huge. And the recovery takes a long time. And ultimately, there's a patient strapped to the backside of those. So I've really kind of narrowed it down over the years to give you guys some tips to kind of keep that process streamlined and as efficient as po possible. Full face, full smile photo. I can't beat it up enough. It was Dr. Um, ah, Andrew Johnson. I almost forgot his name. So prosthodontist, he did a lecture maybe about six months ago I seen, and he explained what I've been saying for so long, the best I've ever heard it put. 2D photo, 3D teeth. 2D photo, 3D teeth, okay? Super, super important, remember that. Something as simple as a 2D photo, but it has to be taken directly straight on. Look at this poor soul. We're gonna go ahead and do our surgical solution, obviously, but we're not gonna know where to make the bone cut if it wasn't for the full face, full smile photo, right? How valuable is that? The simplest thing, if you're a clinician in the room, that's the easiest thing to kick up your game. If you're a technician, oh, get the photo from the doc doctor. And you could do it on a large case, you could do it on a small case, but this is gonna tell the surgical team where they're gonna go ahead and make those bone cuts and restore the patient in the same day conversion. I don't think there's anything that's more valuable. Now, there's been studies to show that Instagram is very bad for teenage girls' health. Instagram is also very bad for technicians and clinicians' health. I do not believe in, I, I mean, I'm just, that is, it's evil cabbage patch. I love the one with the retractors. Ah! All right, so I'm not a really big full face um, scanner guy because I don't need to see the patient's ear hole to tell where I put the midline. If you got one, awesome. That's great. If you don't, don't lose sleep over it because you've seen one on Instagram and you're like, oh my God, I'm gonna take a fourth mortgage out on the practice so we can buy this. Cool technology, but you can get along without it just fine, okay? Eventually, the goal is to have the completely virtual patient. But what's that look like, right? Is that, is that face scanning? and just uploading that into 3Shape? No, not really. Fully virtual patient where you're gonna have the CBCT scan in the full face, but I wanna see lip support. I wanna grab it and pull my design forward and see it move. Now we're going somewhere, okay? <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> so it's up to you. I will, I will still love you if, 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 if you get one. I won't hate you. But here, I got it broken down into two categories you cannot miss. Patient presents. Let's be Dr. Doug. Dr. Doug, patient presents, sends the case in. I'm going to ask Dr. Doug, converted or not converted? Say converted. No, say not converted. Say not converted. Not converted. I'm then going to talk Dr. Doug into converting. <laughs> it just makes life that much easier. Okay? If he says converted, I'm gonna come down the side. Scan for phase two, it's part of our surgical system. There's lots, of, there's lots of variations of all of these out there. I always tell everybody, I don't care which one you use, just use one. It's kind of like standard of care too. Abutment level impression, ugh, ugh. Analog, right? Partially digital, fully digital. All right, those are going to be my pathways I can choose. All right, if I go over here and he's not converted again, I'm gonna beg Dr. Doug, I'm like, please convert him. And he's gonna be like, no, that is a damn pain in the, you know what? So I'm like, all right, you can scan the denture 360 degrees, send it in, let me know where the implants are. Or if Dr. Doug has a printer, put five millimeter holes over it and put a little tab on it. He has a nifty custom tray. You can go ahead and pick up your transfers and take a bite over the top of it and send that in. And that became your master record. Pretty nifty, huh? Pretty nifty. And then if you don't want to do that, then it, yeah, it just sucks. You're going old school, you're getting a bite rim, it's gonna be nasty. And it's all in the details. So I have been just, my whole life has been prosthodontics, right? My whole entire life. Um, 
And I've learned all of this the hard way and, and have had my ass chewed many a times. That's why I don't have one. It's right there. It's truth. All right. So it's all in the details. The best restorative doctors of all in X cases are actually the best dentures, denture doctors, removable prosthodontists, because it's all in the details. Incise the ledge position, midline, can, gingival architecture, tooth shape, overjet, overbite, take the full face, full smile photo, right? Gingival architecture just in need of phonetics, intaglio intimacy, and more. That's just the start, okay? Because this is where we run into problems. Imagine, I see a lot of these. I have for my whole entire career. That's an Rx for a double jaw case. And then we wonder what the heck is going on here, right? This is crazy. Are you serious? Please fabricate new try-in, thank you. And, and I blocked out his name because I'm a good soul. You are not going to get that result. That was the art team did that. That's not a jack magic. The art team made those right there. I didn't make those. You're not going to get that from that. I can promise you. But I got another one. If you see my RX, it's like blank. It's just a bunch of lines. It's to fill things in, right? It's put information in data. It's so very, very important. Like this. So I got this one. Process these biatches. Shade BL4. How awesome is that? And we wonder why sometimes we run into some issues with all on X, right? We run into some issues with all on X. Analog, not, oh, wait. I wasn't going to cover it, but some things recently have been brought to light to me that, that I want to stress on. This is incredibly important. Incredibly important. You can't skip. Look it. There's the rules. I helped write the rules many years ago before you probably did one of these. You follow the rules, you'll be successful. You break the rules, fail. Whose fault is it? Materials or yours? Yours or clinicians. You cannot, if you're going analog, you have to make sure the verification process happened. And you check. And you're like, Dr. Mike, did you verify? Yeah, I verified. No, 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 really. Are you BSing me? Did you even take it out of the box? Yeah, no, I, I didn't. Call a patient back. Call a patient back. I'm now recently here, and we're going to talk about Argon's bars they're doing. It's a great solution for something, a fantastic solution for something, but not for what you think. A lot of people are like, yeah, I like to put the bar under the zirconia because my doctors didn't verify anything and the records are inaccurate and this way it'll flex a little bit and go in and the zirconia won't break. What? That's not a reason to do something. It doesn't make any sense. How about we just gather accurate records in the first place? Then we don't have to worry about it. Let's not skip steps. There's my speech. Ugh, that's like five pounds of putty. But if you're doing analog, you could do it this way and go ahead and put the conversion on. I always tell everybody, you, who's got a pre-op of a hybrid conversion in the mouth? And then an opposing, an abutment level impression. How do you mount that? You can't. You can't. It's worthless. I can't, I can't use that. So you go ahead and just put the conversion on the model with the indexes and then do a putty, not five pounds of putty, but do a putty, and I'll pour it up in acrylic, okay? Digital. Oh, it's the Wild West. And this is, I'm not kidding you, it's crazy out there right now, all right? It is crazy out there. And like this, I've been doing this for like a year now with this slide. I'm like, this Jack's going to tell you yes, and I'm going to say no. Let's talk about this first, gang. There's some things. So if you really had to follow the rules with analog, you really have to follow the rules with digital, all right? One of the best presentations um, I seen, I lectured at this year's ACP on failure, which we'll actually see some of on the back end, but it was Dr. Martin Winendea. If anybody knows Dr. Martin Winendea, he's an incredible clinician out of the UK. Incredible clinician in the UK. And his presentation, I've never said this, it was absolutely brilliant. So digital all on X, are we there yet? And you'll hear all types of stuff. People will be like, no, yes. Nobody really knows. And then you ask them, that, well, so everybody is trying to gauge the accuracy of digital all on X. But his question in his presentation was, the gold standard, 
which is analog stone with a verification jig. Who can tell me the accuracy of that? Who? Who? And nobody knew. But it's the gold standard. Of course. Verified in stone cast. I'll give you the long and the short. By the time he got to the end of the lecture and he compared the two side by side and went all the way down the line, the amount of deviation between the two was insignificant, believe it or not. Now, a lot has to go and take place in order to get that. You're not scanning with, um, I don't know, the tablecloth scanner that just came out for $2,000, right? Because I've seen one. I won't say its name. No, what? The Ivoclar guys, is that them? They do this to me every year. That's the maintenance guys for that. Oh. Oh, same thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> where was I? Yeah, so it, not all scanners are created equal. <laughs> oh, sorry. So we got, what do we got up here? Let's take a look. I'm going to move back here a little bit. Uh, we have analog. We have photogrammetry. Everybody's kind of familiar with that. This little contraption down in the corner is grammetry. And then we have just iOS scanning. Now, I would argue in, in a lot of the cases that I've done that ah, has photogrammetry maybe seen its time. Remember, not all scanners are created equal. What are you scanning with? Some are more accurate than others, OK? Now, my brother has a lab, and he loves photogrammetry. He does a ton of it, a ton of it, because he's like, why not? And I guess you're right. Why not? Doesn't hurt. One of those things, if you wanted to do it, it doesn't bother me. Can you do it without it? Yes, you can do that too. Um, would you have to be far more accurate and far more skilled and well versed in intraoral scanning to do it without? Yes. What do you think, Dr. Mike? Yeah. Because, I mean, going in raw with a scanner, um, I mean, that's to do all on X. It's a lot. It's a lot, right? Hindrance. Everybody gets this one wrong. Everybody gets this one wrong. What is the number one hindrance for a fully digital all on X case? If somebody gets it, either A, you already heard me lecture on it, or B, you're really good. Fully digital all on X. Who's going to get it? Number one hindrance. What prevents you from doing it? Why wouldn't it work? Anybody gonna say tissue? Tissue scans? I'm waiting for tissue scans. Anybody? For, oh, that, that could be a good one. That could be a good one, but we can get it. You know what it is? It's the stupid tie base. It's the tie base. Everybody's like accuracy of scanner, cross arch accuracy, tissue. Vertical is actually a good one, but you can, you can capture that. It's the tie base. You wanna know why? Because if you're following the rules, you need to be able to cement that to something verified, right? If it's fully digital and fully modelless, you don't have anything. So it's the number one hindrance. It's what screws up every fully digital all on X workflow because it exists, because it exists. So now we're going to look at some options, okay, so that we can simply take that out of the equation. And when we do, ooh, amazing things happen. So let's check it out. The kind of sorta, the kind of sorta. So this is the patty technique. Has everybody, anybody done this? Hmm? Anybody else? No? Oh man, awesome. This is what I recommend to most to everybody. I recommend the patty technique the most to everybody because it's the simplest to do and it's like 99.5% digital. It always works and it's super accurate. All right, gets rid of the scanning itch. It gives you a place to cement your tie bases. So. And I'm a ceramist, it really sucks. But, you know, one of the big, you know, positions or goals of any technician was become a ceramist, right? Then it was CAD designer. Do you know what it is now? Data file guy, data file technician. These guys are freaking amazing what they can do. Data, data collection and data handling is the most important thing in a dental laboratory today, hands down. Sorry, ceramists back there on my team. <laughs> but I got a guy, he's absolutely brilliant. I don't even know how he does it. Grabbing this file and importing, exporting, re-uploading, -up uploading, moving, pinning, 
exporting back out, re-importing back in. It's insane. And it's every day in the laboratory. We have two guys that sit there and do scan data files all day long, stacking and merging. That's the new hotness in a dental laboratory. And you guys should prepare yourself for that because it's a language I do not speak. That's why they're there. So what you're going to do is you're going to use the conversion. You're going to pour a stone base. So take the conversion out of the patient's mouth, put analogs on it, take a base former and some stone and stick it in there. If you do a soft tissue, it's nice. So you'd use like PVS or if you have gingival moulage, put it on there, stick it in there. It's not fancy. It's ugly. That's a fancy one. Ignore that. Once it sets up, you could be like a number eight round burr. Go ahead and put a bunch of polka dots in it, okay? Carve a smiley face or your initials. You could do a little heart to me. And then scan it. Scan it on the ugly patty, okay? Then take it off the ugly patty and put it back in the mouth. Let's say Dr. Doug is treating our patient. Our patient is all gonna be Max Lillis today and his name's gonna be Bob, just to make my life easy. So Bob, all right, so Bob, it goes back in the maxilla. Scan the maxilla with it in place. Scan the lower, scan the bite. Take the notes of changes to be made, full face, full smile photo. Send that in with the patty, okay? With the patty. Now, this is where these guys come in that I'm talking about, these little data gurus in the laboratory. Data technicians. Data dental technicians. Do you like it? You're not helping. You're no, you're no help to me. So... What you're going to do, when you, notice we didn't scan the abutments with scan flags. Hmm? The hardest part of the process, we completely eliminated. Doof. So now what are we going to do? Well, it's going to come in, and we're going to put tie bases on, because remember, that conversion should be passive. If it's not, don't worry about it. I got a solution for that, too. You're going to go ahead and put uh, tie bases on it. You're going to scan it in, benchtop scanner. Okay? Now, this is where the guys come in. Remember you scan the conversion on that ugly patty? When you scan the tie bases, you're gonna put those two files together. And once you put those two files together, now we gotta get it into the intraoral cross, uh, cross arch mounted scans. You're gonna use the conversion to align it back in the mouth. When you're all done, all there is in the pan is gonna be the patty and nothing and your prototype or your final hybrid. It works super easy and it's super accurate. So I highly recommend this one before everybody wants to go commando with um, scanners. Now, this is Dr. Chocolandakis' uh, paper and Dr. Papa Spridakos. Um, and I'm very proud when I pronounce his name because it took me like three months to get. And actually, Dr. Chocolandakis was here yesterday. This paper is remarkable. It just came out this past summer. Digital versus conventional full arch implant impressions, retrospective analysis of 36 indentulous jaws. Let's just skip to the conclusion. The 3D implant deviations found between the full arch digital and conventional impressions lie within the clinically acceptable threshold. No statistically significant difference was identified between maxillary and mandibular jaws in terms of 3D deviations. What's he saying? It's the same. There you go. How about that? Thank you guys for that great paper. Remember, Everything's changed, but nothing's changed. This is Dr. Mark Ludlow's scanning protocols for digital all on X, okay? It's super, super important that you adhere to these. Now, I had a good uh, friend of mine that's a clinician. I actually call him dad. His name's Dr. Barry Goldenberg. Uh, he's a prosthodontist, of course. Um, and so he did one of these, and he said, that was a lot of scans. Do I really have to take that many scans? Remember. Everything's changed, but nothing's changed, okay? Yes, you have to take all those scans. If this case came into the laboratory, what are we gonna do analog? We're gonna scan the cast, we're gonna scan the opposing, we're gonna scan the bite, we're gonna scan the pre-op. The same amount of data has to be collected. The only difference is Dr. Mike is collecting the data instead of me. But you still need it. You can't skip steps. He's like, oh, which one of these can I just not do? I'm like, none of them. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just not pour up your impression next time and make it work? No. So you got to collect those. Super important. Totally model is totally digital. Let's look at some options. Powerball, Rosen Screw, La V. What are they? Who's, who in this room has used one or all three of those? Who else? Yeah. Curious, what's your thoughts? 
Did it work? It worked. It worked. Did it work? It worked. Interesting. Interesting. So, it does work. Um, I have been dabbling in two of those three systems. And what it is, in a nutshell, is a DME file, a scan body, and a screw. That's the entire system. And what you're doing is you're milling and going directly to the multi-unit abutment interface. No tie bases. Why do I like that? And why are these being pushed so hard in the industry? You will hear them over and over and over and over and over again. It's getting beat to death. Why? Because it eliminated what? The tie base. What did that bring us? Totally modelist, totally digital, all NX. All right? Jackpot. Now, let's talk about literature. There is none. <laughs> What's going to happen? I don't know. I could tell you from my successes to date, it has been fantastic. It has been fantastic. It's been very accurate. And it's, it's given me something that I want or where kind of the industry is driving for is a digital modelist all NX. Okay? And it's worked out exceptionally well. What does that look like five years from now? I don't know. I don't know. And we're probably not going to see any data or literature out on it because obviously we're outpacing that stuff right now. Okay? Um, but I can tell you, Nobel was milling to the multi-unit abutment interface for how long? A decade, at least? This is not new. It's not new. Everybody's like, oh, I don't know if I want to go to the multi-unit abutment. Well, they've, it's, it's been happening whether you did it or not. So it's not new. Um, I, have you seen any research papers on it? I can't even find one on the Nobel process. Um, I've looked. One of the questions comes up, and this is where we are at the, the industry. We're kind of looking at disposable dentistry, Dr. Will Martin told me, and I really liked how he said that. Like with the digital dentures. When it wears out, throw it away. Right in the garbage. You can print a new one. You don't have to gather any records. Disposable dentistry. Kind of the same thing with the Zerk. One of the questions comes up is, what about fretting? I don't know. It's going to happen? Maybe. But you know what everybody's coming back to me and telling me? And these are actually like kind of, I mean, a lot of pro in the prosthodontic community. I would rather replace a multi-unit abutment every five years than constantly re-cement bonded tie bases and deal with the hassle and headache. And oh, by the way, it gives me a fully digital modelist workflow. So the idea or the concept of throwing away a multi-unit abutment that may have experienced some wear and replacing it with another multi-unit abutment five years down the line does not hold enough weight for them not to do it. You see where I'm kind of going with that? It doesn't make sense. The benefits of doing it far outweigh the benefits of not doing it. And that's kind of what it looks like. So the Rosen screw is a taper. And the power ball is over here. You see this? You got about like two millimeters of material as an interface between the top of the multi-unit abutment and the bottom of the screw. Obviously, because you've seen that tie base I showed you guys, what was that, maybe two tenths of a millimeter? You could not torque down on that if that was zirconia, because you would snap through. This is what it gives you, that big chunk, and that's what you torque down to. Rosen screw, you don't torque. You don't torque, hand tighten which is like almost like 15 Newton centimeters anyways. I mean, I'm not very powerful, but you kind of get in the range. And the uh, La Vie, is it La Vie? Ooh, sounds very French. The La Vie um, is like a combination of both of these. It's kind of neat. It's kind of neat, but here's three. If you didn't know, and this is new to you, here's three, three the La Vie is, is the newer of the two. There's three systems already on the market right now. So you see where this is driving. Um, that's the issue right there. That's too thin. You can angle correct the power balls. And those are little power ball scan bodies. And we'll go ahead and kind of trace around and, and do the scan. I got a haul. And sometimes if you're having trouble getting the track, you do a little ortho chain on there. Boop, 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 pop it around a circle. It'll pick it up. Look at that. Look at this tori. Oh. Oh, those are nasties, huh? <laughs> so go ahead and uh, you'll see this is prime scan. Bam, jumps right on there. 
comes into me, we design it, happy patient, power bald. Okay, it's weird when the case went out, so I prototyped them, right? Case came back in, prototypes were great. Go ahead and just remill the old file, remill the old file, send it back. The pan is empty. There's nothing in there. There's not a giant SAM 3 that weighs 12 pounds because of plaster. It's just two hybrids. It's actually kind of remarkable and more efficient in a laboratory. You want to know why? When the case comes in, it doesn't have to go to models, and then it doesn't have to go to mounting, and it doesn't have to go through that login on the analog side, right? Then gets scheduled out, soft tissue, analogs. Now the case, Nathan's smiling, that's his job. Now the case comes right in, and it goes immediately into design. I can cut a week off my turnarounds because I eliminated all of the model work and processes beforehand. Ooh, now we're getting more efficient. So very cool. Keep an eye on it. This case with dad. Um, he's not here today. I hate that. Lost without him. But we're not done yet. So this was the denture and the FP2-ish provisionals on the lower. Uh, there are three separate bridges. When we deliver this, I will update you guys with the photos so you can check it out. But he did that all in one appointment, and it was completely passive. Pretty neat. And this, so this is not new, but it'll be new to you because really nobody knows about this. I did this with Dr. Ludlow in 2021, which was the Atlantis Bridge Base. When they first told us about it, they said, oh, that's going to be really cool. I'm like, I think we almost, I can't speak for him, but we were kind of in use and that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Because we're not bar under zirconia guys, right? So Dr. Mark Montana at the same time argued. He said, I am. And I said, why? And he said, because in my practice, I have patients coming in all the time that I have to fix and repair from bad, broken Zerk. Hmm, interesting. Did you restore it? No. They come to me to fix the mess. I'm like, oh, did I make it? He's like, no. So I would argue, is it a material issue or is it an education issue? Huh? Because somebody did something they weren't supposed to somewhere. But we're going to blame the zirconia. Mm, I don't know if I'm buying that, guys. Not really buying that. And shoving a big Band-Aid up it is not a way to, to justify it or fix it. All right? But I'm going to tell you what we are going to do. What we are going to do. So we're going to remember, we're going to get the tie base is the biggest hindrance to the all-on-x workflow. All right? And I'm looking for a way to remove the tie base. What does the bar do? So you can't individually cement six tie bases in a hybrid freehand. I would highly recommend against that. At least you shouldn't, right? If you do, just don't tell me. I still love you. But you shouldn't. Why? Because they're all swinging like this. All right, it's probably not going to fit when you go to the mouth, but what can you do? You could take a bar structure, like the argon bars, and yes, you could cement that. So now what do we have? We have a fully digital, fully modelless workflow. And at the end, you're cementing the bar. And that's what this workflow gave us, OK? And it's available. You could do these right now. Here's the patient she presented. Obviously, Dr. Ludlow did a ton of surgery on her. Here's the scans. Important areas to capture. You guys must make sure your clinicians or yourselves that you're capturing these important areas, the facial tissue, retromolar pad. If you go back to the retromolar pad on the first scan, you must go back to the retromolar pad on every subsequent scan after that. Wow, somebody get me a beer. <laughs> but you're gonna do it every time. And this, all right, so dentate scans. This was Ludlow, Renee, Atal. 2019, 2020, 18 microns cross arch accuracy. Dentate, All right? There's this paper. For implant cases, 43 microns cross arch accuracy. I'm still good, right? 43 microns cross arch accuracy for implant cases. Again, Renee Ludlow et al, 2021. Those are pretty good numbers. Those are pretty good numbers. And that's not with photogrammetry. All right. So this study comes up, and it's interesting. And the, it, this is like one of the, only one of a kind, the, the Jockstad study, right? So the Jockstad paper, and it's old. 
from 2015 that said you could have up to, it's over here, you could have up to 100 microns of misfit and still maintain passivity. It's kind of interesting, right? That's a lot. That's a lot. There's not another paper out there that's like that, though. Here's what the cross mount scans look like. And this is the modular. So now, I don't know if I can, are you guys, are you guys? I don't want to, because I always mess you up, and I feel bad now. You print new indentures, right? Yeah. Can you do it? In May. All right. In May, they will be printing what, Jeff? Lucitone print dentures you could send to Argon. Um, so you could do the same exact thing. The first one we did, because I won't do a traditional bar wrapped acrylic anymore. All right, there's lots of reasons. And my setup guy is like, I can only get my arm like here. So I'm like, okay, it's better just to do it digital. So we're going to go ahead and print the base. And in this example, we use carded teeth. It's going to slip over the bar. For example, patient Bob Maxilla presents to Dr. Doug. Dr. Doug is going to use what scan bodies? There you go. You're going to put them in. You're going to scan them to this multi-unit abutment. He's got to be loaded to multi-unit abutment. He's got to be converted. Scan it. Go ahead and design the bar. Send it to Argon. They're going to go ahead and manufacture it and send it back to you. And then you're going to design your zirconia structure or your acrylic structure over the top. You see what I'm saying? Slick. And that you could do modelist. Why? Because you're just cementing the precision bar instead of a bunch of tie bases. And it goes like this. Doop. And that's kind of what it looks like finished. And that's what it looks like in the mouth. Check this out. That's two appointments. So she came in for the scanning appointment. And she came in for the delivery appointment. There's the fit. Whoa, that's crazy. And it was fully digital and it was fully modelless. See where we're kind of driving to you guys in the industry and you guys got to stay on top of this stuff. And remember data, digital data is so valuable now. That is like the position in the lab, the position in the lab. Tuberosities, go ahead and get your scans. Dr. Ludlow will go ahead and run articulating paper through so you can go ahead and make sure that those scans are aligned properly the way they should be. Here's our design. Ooh, zirconia. So green stage finish, center, Mio shades, Mio structure, and we're coming up on done. Let's see how good that bar fit. Oh, yeah, there's something is there. Touchdown, perfect. That you could cement by itself all day long and they could make the bars for you, okay? They can make the bars for you. Remember the scanning protocols, get all of that information in, get all that data, design your bar, send it to them, you get the bar back, then go ahead and do your zirconia, bam. Or you could do the lucitone print in May or earlier. <laughs> <laughs> He's mouthing me all types of terribleness right now. Um, we have a long history of doing that stuff. But yeah, you can go ahead and send if you want an acrylic. It's like your modern version of bar wrapped acrylic. Design the base, and you could use printed teeth or carded teeth or milled teeth, whatever you want. Put that into the base and then the base over the bar. It's like a sandwich. Very cool. And because it's archive data, archive data, if you do need to retread that patient down the road, just reprint the file. Now, I would only do Zerk, but if there's a reason you want to do the acrylic, you can with that same technology the guy's got. So a lot of people don't think of doing that, like putting the sleeve over the bar like that, but you should. Yes, sir. Ooh, I might get this to Dr. Mike. Occlusion zirconia to zirconia. No, yeah. Very little data. I can tell you there's nothing that says it's detrimental and there's nothing that says it's beneficial. So <laughs> that didn't really get you anywhere, but <laughs> there you go. And let's see. We are going to make it, which is insane. Uh, there's, so delivery. Yay, 
was a little funky right here, but he said, I mean, you remember, he said he bumped that and everything went, just fell right in place. Everything nestled in really, really nicely. That's insane because when I delivered it to him, I delivered it to him on a hybrid in a box and nothing else with the bar cemented. Hmm? Individually, yes. That's the only reason you can do so, so they can, I'm big on this. You should only cantilever 10 millimeters past the most distal implant monolithic zirconia, right? I've been saying it for years. Yes. We're getting more and more patients now that want teeth to the back of the head. In that instance, you could go upwards of 15 millimeters. Well, in, well, is, is max allowable as the AP spread is. So AP spread never comes into play for zirconia arches because you can't, the AP spreads could say you can go back 20 millimeters, but you can't because it's a material um, would be compromised. But now in a bar case, you have the benefit of extending back further to give them that 14th molar they want. <laughs> They're like, well, I'm paying for it. Why can't I get six extras? I mean, that's kind of way it's, it's crazy. I'm like, you can't, you don't have no more room to put teeth any farther back in your head. Unless that becomes a new dental, a dental treatment where you just bore back further and open it up. What do you think, Dr. Mike? <laughs> this is our surgical solution just to touch on it, but this is stuff that's out there. Um, obviously you guys know it's a latch system. It kind of hinges in the middle, opens up in the mouth and closes down. But the cool part about this is the SIM guide. So the SIM guide goes onto the bar, the base guide. All right, this is our patent pending device. We're gonna use this. So what happens if I told you, we're gonna gather all of the restorative records at the surgical phase. During the surgical appointment, we're gonna scan the SIM. Oh, look at that. Bloody field. That will screw up the scanner. So. What the guys did was they went ahead and this one, they put a little rubber dam. The Inceriza guys use like 15 pounds of blue goo. Uh, our new SIM guide, we're already on Gen 2 uh, version that we've developed. And the new SIM comes out and all the way back and covers the bloody field completely. And only the scan appliances are exposed. Pretty neat. So that's Gen 2. Go ahead and take the scans. You'll deliver your conversion. Come on. Oh! You can see there's fiduciary markers on the bar and on the SIM guide. You'll do all that. When the patient comes back to check the implants and make sure everything's in integrated before being released to the restorative side, right? You will then take the tissue scan. That's the one scan you can't capture during the surgery. So you'll take it then and then the bite scan because they've been wearing it for a little bit and you've got them all set up, right? Now, your first restorative appointment is not record gathering. Your first restorative appointment is prototype trying. Hmm. How about that? I have always said I have failed thousands of times, both personally and professionally. Everybody usually laughs when I say the personally part because nobody wants to admit that. But it's true. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you it's not. Like this day. The day that I super glued my thumbs to the prototype Triant. That's a bad dental day. And damn, they were on there so bad. So bad. I actually, I mean, I lost layers when we peeled those things off, okay? That's a bad dental day, but that's my failure. That and my super nasty dry chicken skin. But we're gonna talk about a material failure, a PICN, a polymer infiltrated ceramic network, okay? Where we are in the industry is we're seeing incredible advancements. Some of these advancements, coupled with, I don't know, Instagram, uh, are outpacing the literature. And it's gonna, that's not gonna change. You can't get, how long, how long does it take to get a research paper out? A year-ish, maybe, two? So we're seeing these advancements come quicker than what the research and the data can support or keep up with. So now we're our own best resource, right? So we got to stick together. This kind of went like wildfire. PICN, it's a polymer infiltrated ceramic material. It's going to be milled. It's going to be milled for hybrids. Woo! I asked Dr. Ludlow for the nastiest bar wrapped acrylic he's ever seen come in that failed, and he sent me that. Whew. 
That is nasty. That is nasty. And the problem is tons of these patients were restored this way. Again, another paper by uh, Dr. Papaspridakos in 2012. Look at this number. At 10 years, only 8.6% of those restorations had a chance of being complication-free. That's not good. If you haven't figured it out, that's not good, okay? And we don't have this problem with zirconia. Hello? <laughs> All right. But we're going to do, now at this point, I'm going to come up with like kind of a fancy version. Like you've seen my Lucitone hybrid. That's cool, right? This is going to be completely different. It's completely different. We're going to go ahead and design the teeth. We're going to wax on. We're going to process it conventionally. And we got a result like that. I'm like, wow, look at that. That's super nice. You know what everybody's deal with this was? Oh, because all of like the zirconia talking points, like it breaks, it's loud. You know, all the stuff that's been beaten to death for years and like totally has no like weight whatsoever. So yeah, everybody's like, oh, this is the new hotness. It look, I can make it look good, right? Huh? A milled, milled nano hybrid ceramic. This is a milled nano hybrid ceramic. And then six months later, oh, oh. See, and this is what frustrates me. And you guys have been here hanging out with me for years. There's no reason to even go there, right? There's just not. Well, zirconia breaks. Well, how about that trophy? That thing is trashed and stained. Ooh, how about this one? When they're like, it's repairable. Yeah, so let's add insult to injury and prep a three unit bridge and stick it on there. That makes sense. Would it never broke in the first place? Just saying. What about this one? This was Dr. Luis Gonzaga from UF. Complication on zirconia maxilliverse milled teeth hybrid mandible. All right. I thought this was my only surviving one. Thoughts. I've replaced every, so, so, spoiler alert, I've replaced all those cases with Zerk. Every single one of them, at my expense, okay? Followed up with him, by the time we got to the ACP, it blew apart in the mouth. It's toast, it's gone. Toast, it's gone. Look at this, woo, that looks like fun, delamination. And it was so bad, he packed so much food down in there that he actually split it from the top to the bottom. That's the days where you're definitely like, you gotta give the dentist credit, because that had to be nasty to pick that back out of there. This one, delamination. This one, whoop. How about here? We'll make the bar out of metal. That'll work. Oh, fellow technicians and clinicians are reporting similar failures. You were waiting for the sound, here it comes. Look at the staining, look at this. It's repairable, that's my favorite. It's repairable. With some GC pattern resin. <laughs> it's nasty, come on. Like this, the, I did not make this one. This one came into me to remake in Zirconia and I'm like, are you serious? This can't, are you serious? That's terrible. Oh, not good. It's, it's worse when you hit it with the steamer, it warms up. How about this one? Maybe the metal bar structure is under design. Let's do like Montreal style, that'll work. Nope. You see where I'm getting at? Sometimes everybody gets a real rock for wanting something that's not zirconia, right? They, I mean, it's like, it's, it's, you're, it's cool to hate the zirconia, right? Why? It's the best restorative material we have. Hands down, is it perfect? No, no it's not. Is it the best? Right now it is. Until you come see me and Jack tells you otherwise, yes. The recovery for all of those cases was zirconia, which is what they should have been restored in in the first place, okay? What they should have been restored in the first place. Themodinstitute.com, if you got any questions for Dr. Defee, um, especially on the zirconia bonding, he covered a great amount of information. There's Dr. Defee at themodinstitute.com. Of course, you guys know where to find me. 
Can I see? We made it with like 10 minutes to spare. Oh, thank you guys so much.